Yo, what's shaking, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Orange Bloods Modcast here on the Orange Bloods Texas Football Channel. I'm joined by, I'm Jeff Ketchum, joined by Jason Sukumo, Anwar Richardson, and Alex Dunlap. Do us a solid, like the video, subscribe to the channel. We are creeping up on 13,000 subscribers. Every little bit matters. So if you're new to the channel, if you're just jumping in, first time you've checked us out, yeah, click on that subscribe button, like the video. Uh, we talk a lot of Texas football, and we will throughout this video and moving forward. We are now 16 days away from the season opener. We've had an open practice this week, which we will talk at length about today. As a matter of fact, let's just start there. Jason, I'll come to you first, and we'll go around the room. I, I, one of my favorite questions I like to ask throughout this, especially once we get into the season, it's kind of where your head is. What are you, What are you thinking about this team today? I'm going to ask that question to everybody, but in the context of you got a chance to watch them practice just a couple of nights ago on Tuesday. So as we begin the recording on the modcast today, how are you feeling about this team? Where's your head? Well, I'll kind of package that in with what we heard about the scrimmage on Saturday. You know, we got some pretty good intel on that. We got to watch practice Tuesday night. Um, <laughs> uh, how do I feel about this team? Do we want this to be an uplifting modcast catch, or, or are we shooting straight here? Um, I mean, you, you, it, this thing always goes where it goes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think this team has work to be done. Uh, you know, And we all focus, everybody's focused on the quarterback position. And, you know, I think Anwar and Alex will probably tell you, both those guys made plays on Tuesday night downfield and made some nice throws. But there was a lot of mistakes and a lot of uh, – forced I would call it forced action and forced throws and turnovers and we heard about it on Saturday at the scrimmage there were at least three interceptions thrown uh the ball was put on the turf four times on in fumbles Sark said so um I think this team I mean certainly it has a lot of potential uh but I do think it's still a work in progress they've got a couple weeks to kind of iron out the wrinkles I love that we saw on Tuesday night uh two freshmen starting on the offensive line uh, Tariq Milton's kind of taken over in the slot as they moved Whittington outside. I thought that was interesting. Um, so, you know, I thought it was actually a pretty interesting practice to watch on Tuesday in terms of, whoa, there's actually some new developments going on. But uh, I still think this team has a bit of work to do, particularly on the offensive side of the ball. And I say that we don't know what we're going to get from the defense. This was a pretty bad defense last year, but it's making this offense have to to work for it, and it's making this offense turn the ball over quite a bit. Um, so that's a bit of a red flag for me. Alex, give us your opening shot today. Man, I mean, I just have a ton. You know, it's like getting to go to that one practice. It was a treat for us, you know, just getting to see a whole practice, getting to see team periods, getting to see 11-on-11 11 11 inside run stuff, one-on-ones, offensive line versus defensive line. There was a lot to take away. I'm like Jason. You know, to me, all eyes go to the quarterback position, and I'm not really sure I have too much to take away from that. It feels to me like Quinn Ewers is going to win that job. I think he gets named starter after this next scrimmage. I just it, it feels it feels. I mean, he just looks better. He's 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 making less less mistakes. He's going to get named starter. And then as far as the uh, as far as the uh, the the young offensive lineman, I mean, that was just awesome. Like I said it out there. I mean, losing Junior Angelau. It's no good, right? It's it's not anything that anybody would have hoped for. It's, it's a bad development for this football team. But if you just talk about the way that the offense just looked, the way the offensive line looked with Kelvin Banks and DJ Campbell in there, it's like I'll be damned if that offensive line doesn't look better than a lot of Texas offensive lines we've seen over the course of the last few years. Now how those guys progress and, and if they could come in and immediately live up to their potential – We'll see, but uh, that thing shook out exactly as I had projected it to whenever I came home and wrote that column on uh, Sunday night after we got the news about Angelo and after we got the news about Isaiah Nair. Um, other than that, you know, some interesting groupings on defense, uh, some interesting things on defense that they did with DeMarvion Overshown. Certainly interesting to see Byron Murphy in there seemingly working ahead of Keandre Coburn as he always probably should have been. Um and I'm sure there's a million other things, just, you know, the minutia of it that, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of important things to talk about. I'm sure we, we will throughout the course of the rest of this modcast. Mr. Richardson, your turn. Well, in, in my opening thing, I'll answer Jay Lee's um, question that's on the screen about 
uh, basically about gamers and what's the chance that Quinn is a gamer and not really a good practice guy. If that's the case, then Quinn Ewers doesn't start this season because we saw that story last year with Casey Thompson, who was supposed to be more of a gamer than a practice person, uh, but Hudson was more of a practice person than a gamer. And so at that point, if that ends up being true, then Quinn Ewers is not your starter. Uh, so I don't think that's, you know, I don't think you can go that route. I mean, I know what you're trying to do, Jaylee. I know you want to, you know, feel a little bit better about the situation. And there's still reasons for optimism. Um, but, you know, you, you the only problem would be Hudson is, isn't doing great in practice either. So you you would have you kind of stuck with two guys who aren't really, quote unquote, great, great at practice at this moment um, that you would hope to be gamers. Uh, for me, though, you know, catch, you know, to me, it is about, you know, Quinn and waiting, like, like Alex said, waiting for um that shooter drop waiting for let's one seeing what happens this Saturday in the scrimmage and seeing if there's some progress and some updates. The Sarkeesian is supposed to speak to the media at, on tonight uh, around 5 p.m. or I guess this afternoon at 5 p.m. So we'll see if there's anything new or is there any kind of updates uh, that's that's there. Uh, you guys are not smiling once this morning. Feels like dinner with the in-laws. I'm, I'm always smiling. Come on. You guys are crazy. I mean, that makes me smile. It doesn't take much. I mean, I, I, my only excuse is I did a show to damn near 11 o'clock last night, and I was up this morning trying to get kids ready for school. So, I, you know, I'll try to pump it up, but you got to get, you know, you got to give me a second on that. Um, that's kind of it for me catching. And the second thing for me is, Oh, as we wait for Quinn is, you know, Steve Sarkeesian, the, the, you know, with the, the QB whisperer title, you know, this is, again, another opportunity for him to, you know, be the guy that is supposed to be the person that develops QBs and uh, takes guys to the next level. So, you know, what you, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, my thoughts are, you know, him, what Sarkeesian not only does with, with Quinn, but the entire team, like, you know, catch the last thing I'll say, you know, me, uh, you know, I, I know you, you, we always talk, it's like, uh, you remember the old commercials like taste great, less filling, taste great, less filling. And I feel like you, you'll say something about recruiting rankings and I'll say coaching. Then you'll say recruiting rankings and I'll say coaching. And now I'm going to go back to, for me, I'll just shout down coaching. That's what I want to see. You know, I'm, Hey, let me, I'm so y'all both are still convinced it's going to be Quinn. It sounds like, huh? Yep. You, are you not? I don't know, man. Like, I mean, Literally, I think three, maybe four people said that Hudson Card was better in the scrimmage on Saturday by a sizable margin, two people told me. Um, one person I talked to this week just said, hey, man, I, like there's some sentiment on the team that they want – some of the older guys want Hudson to win the job. I mean, that, it's Sark's decision, obviously. But – and that's not, not that they dislike you or I just – maybe they've just been around Hudson a little longer. I don't know, but – um. I don't know, man. I think this scrimmage on Saturday, if, if Hudson's a lot better or better on Saturday again, I mean, Quinn has not separated the way we all thought he would. Um, I don't know. I'm just Jason, not forward- Jason, how can it be a sizable margin when Hudson throws a pick six and fumbles on the goal? I just, like, I mean, every single time, like, oh, I mean, there's good point on more, but what did Quinn do? Quinn obviously had not. A, a I mean, you well. tell me Quinn threw eight interceptions? Like, I don't know how that's sizable at, at that he, point. I know he had at least one or two, and uh, I think if Hudson just moved the ball better, I mean, Quinn had a deep connection, I think, with, I don't even remember, was Casey Kane? I can't remember who it was in that. Uh, but, um, no, that was in the that was, that was you. Had three people tell me, and I think Catch had one told him Hudson was better, and two people said by a sizable margin. And one person literally told me if you were picking the starter based off this scrimmage, you'd have to pick Hudson Card. Well, I mean, that's that's one person's opinion. I would say if you're basing it no, on that one open practice, you would I think three or four. Well, all, right, okay, all right. Well, I'll tell you this, and you, and you know this is true, Jason. If you were basing it off that open practice, it would have to be Quinn Ewers. No, t- no. What? Neither what one. Mean, of what do you mean? What? Right? That was fifty. 50 were, you, were, you, were, you, were you watching it? I mean, it was it, like that. That, that, that was a, that was a very. I mean, what about, the, what, about the to, what about the pick to what about the pick to Jaron Thompson? The awful pick on the play whenever Ethan Burke beat um, Christian yeah, okay. Jones. I'm just I'm trying to even think. Just like off the top of my head, I'm thinking we're about pick after pick after pick. Went through the, uh, like if you're one a pick six to. Uh, Jameson, he had another one where he forced a terrible interception. I mean, they both made a lot of – you're the only person I've heard, and maybe Anwar will say differently, you're the only person I've heard look at that open practice and say, 
I, when you were a lot better than well, I don't Jones. care. I don't care what other people say. I mean, I, I'm, well, I'm, 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 I'm an independent thinker. I don't care what other people say. Well, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> Quinn Ewers was not much better than Hudson Card. They both connected on a couple deep passes. They both turned the ball over multiple times. I mean, what did Quinn do that was so much better than Hudson Card? Please tell me. He just didn't throw his terrible picks. He didn't make terrible decisions. And, 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 then you and, weren't watching. Then you were not watching. <laughs> that you saw. I will say that from an independent and Ottawa, I want to come to you on this because it's funny that the conversation has organically <laughs> gone here because I wanted to go back to – Sarkeesian's comments at Big 12 Media Days, which was the headline that day. And Alex, I know you'll remember this too. We all, the three of us talked about it. The number one headline that day was his comment that he thought he would make an announcement earlier in this camp than he did from uh, the previous season when he named Hudson Carr the starter over Casey Thompson, which we're kind of creeping up on that time frame. It was a year ago after the first scrimmage that Hudson started to take a lot of the reps with the ones and Casey wasn't. And what was it about a week after that on war that the decision was officially announced? I'm trying I don't think to it was officially it. announced until we, but we knew because we, where it was headed. I, it took uh another a couple of weeks or so i don't know i don't know if he announced it officially catch he may not have announced it officially until game week but i think we had already known for two weeks i'm gonna look it up right now but i think yeah, yeah, look that up. i i will just say as an observer who was not at tuesday's practice so i'm reading the orange was practice report notes live as they came in and i'm watching on twitter because a lot of people were posting videos which I know the school had to absolutely love of like every, anything that happened in practice that was noteworthy. It felt like there were 10 people who had a, a version of that play up on Twitter at some point pretty quickly. My impression from just watching it from afar was that there were just too many mistakes from the quarterbacks period that it felt like both quarterbacks had three or four interceptions over the course of the practice by the end of the practice, I thought I had counted eight. And I don't know how to split it. It felt like it was about four and four. There were still too many sacks that were being taken. I think if – and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. It still feels like of the two quarterbacks, since Sarkeesian made the comments before last week's first scrimmage, that sacks are a no-no with him. That, you know, that is one of the things that irks him the most – about quarterback play it was one of the things that separated the two slightly in the scrimmage was that I think yours took three sacks in the scrimmage and maybe Carr didn't quite take as many sacks. It was another thing that popped up on Tuesday. It just feels like that position is not very good right now. And I, I don't know how anybody stands on the table for either player when Every time I check with a source or every time I hear that one of you has checked with a source, the description of the quarterback position, and as nicely as you can put it, is that it's a work in progress. But there are other ways to describe it, and not good could be one of them. There's too many mistakes and turnovers from both of them. And at this point, it's it seems like Anwar Sarkeesian is in a position where he's trying to find the guy who's going to commit the least amount of mistakes more so than who's the guy that th pushes the ball down the field more, who's the more dangerous player. I think you want to try to get through your first game and then your second game without there being just a cluster of mistakes and turnovers at the position, but he hasn't been left with great options based on their performances. Yeah, uh, so catch. I'm I'm looking. It looks like he, you know, from some of the stuff we had, it looks like it. It looks like he informed the Q officially on the 28th of August, um, which was close to the season opener. But but Casey, I mean uh, Hudson, had been operating as the number one after yeah. that first scrimmage. So I think and then and then the, it, it, he said both guys would play in the game. Then you remember. Um, I think he said something. There was some stuff that was supposed to happen, and I, and I think Casey came in a little bit later 
than he thought he was supposed to come in. Uh, I think he came in like the third or fourth or something to that effect. Um, to your point, though, to, to, to the bigger point, Catch, I don't think – I don't think there's anybody that I've talked to or anybody else. I think Jason's the only person that's heard something that, uh, which is kind of brand new information for me, that there seems to be a sizable difference between the two. I've heard no, nothing no. that's I said that. at the scrimmage, at the, only at the scrimmage. I'm not saying overall. Only at the scrimmage, but what about from an overall practice standpoint? Then, no, Jason? I think they're neck and neck. I did find it interesting. ESPN had an article today. Throw them a bone as if they need it. Um, and they got a one-on-one -on -one interview with Sark. Shocking, right? Uh, and Sark did say in that story, like, he does have – he's he says he's kind of leaning one direction. But, no, overall, Omar, I think it's a very close race. Sark said as much on Monday. He literally said it's very close. Um, I just heard on the scrimmage on Saturday, literally one practice, that uh, Hudson was the better player on Saturday. Okay. Um yeah, you know, yeah, catch that. Like I said, that, I haven't heard much you know, about it. We've heard about, you know, the work that uh, Quinn needs to put in, you know, outside of, you know, this on the field, but some of the things that he needs to do, like off the field, as far as just being a young guy and learning about preparation. Um, and, you know, again, you're hoping that that stuff kind of takes care of itself. Uh, but yeah, you know, I you know, I kind of forget your, your, your question a little bit because I was looking up the dates just to make sure I knew. Uh, when everything was supposed to, you know, just kind of going back to the original thing. I, I'll, I'll just say this on my stuff. I, I I would be pretty surprised if he went with Hudson. And I think if he goes with Hudson, that says so many different things, Catch. I, and it, it also, I think it paints him a little bit in the corner at that point as so far as like what's going on with these QBs and, you know, are you getting it right? Are you not getting it right? Are you willing to go with Hudson a second time? After, you know, some of what happened last is all forgiven and has he grown and, and progressed. And if he hasn't, you know, the first, inter, you know, the first interception, the first fumble, the first mistake, people are going to say, what the hell? Because they're going to want Quinn in there. Um, and there's going to be, a, you know, and people are going to like bang the table, like where the hell is Quinn? Why is he not playing? Uh, you know, and Hudson want, can't can't be good. He would almost have to be great because anything is good. People are going to say, what about the other guy behind him? I think I'll you'll have a fan uproar if it uh, if it ends up being Hudson Card. I mean, people want to see Quinn Ewers. The fans want to see. It's not fair to Hudson, but it, it's true. I mean, the fans want to see Quinn Ewers. I, I think you're right, Almore. If he, if Sark picks Hudson Card, and I still think it's going to be Quinn, but if, if he picks Hudson Card and let's say Hudson struggles against Alabama and then he pulls him out like he did against Arkansas and puts Quinn in, then that's not a great look for Sark. So it's it's a that's a risky decision if he goes with Hudson Card. I, both of these quarterbacks, I think, are in a position where if they perform poorly, I mean, I, I, all of us have covered this program long enough to know what it sounds like inside the stadium when the, the stadium is unhappy with the quarterback play. It, it is a noise and a tension that gets created that you can feel on the sidelines. It's a grumble. It's a grumble. Oh, it's a, oh, <laughs> and when the mistake happens, there's just, oh, a rabble. Yeah. You, can, you can hear that rabble, rabble. Rah, 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 rah. You can just <laughs> hear that in the crowd. Yeah. We know that Hudson, if he were named the starter, oh, <laughs> he gets a mistake. <laughs> and then it's like, bring in the other guy. What does this look like for Quinn, though? I, I'm... <laughs> I just thought this thing would be more emphatic on war. I thought we would be getting yeah. to this point and that the Quinn Ewers phenomena would have started to take off a little bit. I would say that for one of the first, what this camp has done for me has made me slow down on the notion that I think the Ewers camp has helped promote, even in the recruitment of uh, Arch Manning, which is, Hey, we're just going to be here two years. When we take off, you get to come in in red shirt, and we'll be out by 2024. And then, Arch, you can just step on in and compete for that starting job. And that's not just us that has created this kind of storyline that exists inside the program. And I would just say, at this point, that feels rushed all of a sudden. I'm not – a thousand percent convinced that this season ends 
with him being the best quarterback in the Big 12, and then next year is about can he be the best quarterback in the country, things may need to slow down a little bit. And I, I wonder what it looks like on war and how long the slack is if Ewers is given the starting job against Louisiana Monroe. Let's say he has a good game against Louisiana Monroe. Then he goes again. And let's say it just doesn't work that day for reasons that aren't entirely his. How much slack does he have before Sark feels like he would put the other quarterback in just to see if that provides a spark and a change? I hope th- I think the leash has got to be long with Quinn. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think you can, you know, I think you, if you go with Quinn, you're committing to me to, to to learning, growing, and developing, and going through all the growing pains that a young quarterback is supposed to go through. I think you know you don't want to sacrifice wins by any stretch of the imagination. So obviously, it would have to be you know horrifically off the chain, uh, you know you know tracks rather for it to for you to pull them. But I think you know, and I saw Jason shake shake his head yes. I think you just got to give him as many opportunities as you can. And if it works, you know, at certain games, great. You got to know it's going to be good. It's going to be bad. And But you're building towards the future. You got a young offensive line. Like, I think you just got to give him as many opportunities as possible. I think you could – I think your, the leash could be shorter when you've got Casey Thompson behind you and, you know, and you know, okay, he's been on campus for a little while. But, you know, you see what he can do, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I just don't know – I think it would have to be. I think it would. I think the only way Quinn gets pulled, catch, is if if, if Sark goes and, and they're doing a film study, and so he, and it's like there's reads that he could have made that weren't there. He's taking a bunch of sacks that aren't there. He's or just like there. he just looks at Quinn and just say, "Dude, you're doing the exact thing I told you not to do." Correct. You're doing Correct. the exact thing I told you not to do. I mean, it, it's 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 gonna take stuff like that. Yeah, like if it's just deer in the headlights. Like and, and you and then at that point you just got to you got to pull them. Anything short of that, to Alice's point, I think you got to ride with them. Because we would have said this about road. Hudson last year, right? Once he was named the starter, I think that conversation would before he played a game would have sounded very similar to what Anwar just said. And yet Hudson did have the deer in the headlights look, and he start he played for six and a half quarters before. He was yanked as the starting quarterback and kind of yanked for good at that point. I think we all agree that can't happen with Quinn, right? But there does you have can, to be you a can point where it against Alabama. If Quinn Ewers really it's struggles true. against Alabama, you're like, it's Alabama. You know, okay, we, we give him a pass on that one. You're probably not going to yank him just because he has a bad game against Alabama. So um, I am in total agreement with Almore. I think Quinn would have a long leash. I think Hudson, fair or not, would have a short leash. If, it, if he wound up being the guy, I mean, he would have a very short leash. But I agree with Almar. If it's Quinn, you're going to have to take your lumps. And I think Alabama, if if he takes a lot of lumps against Alabama, the way Hudson maybe did against Arkansas, you can kind of be like, okay, it was Alabama. You know, if it happens against UTSA in the next week, okay, that's a different story. Alabama, so, you can kind of gloss over. Quinn, as a starter, has one of those retractable leashes where the dog <laughs> can just run all over the place and has like 15 feet. Of, of runway to go in any direction, whereas Hudson has a short leash where he kind of has to walk side by side with yeah. its owner. Pretty much. Yeah, I think, okay, enough. that's the Texas quarterback <laughs> position in a nutshell right now. Let's talk about the rest of the team. There are so many other aspects of this team. I'll make this a wild card round of discussion. And Alex, I'll start with you. You can talk about any position, any area of the team that from the open practice you are still thinking about quite a bit on a Thursday. Okay. Um, Well, we've talked a lot about the offense. We've talked about, you know, a good bit about the offensive line. So maybe just some things from defense. I did think it was interesting. You know, we mentioned a little bit earlier Byron Murphy playing with the first group on all basically all the team sessions that we were able to see. Him and him and 45, Vernon Broughton, which is just, you know, they were the at the beginning of camp and all through spring. And, you know, they're during their time at Texas. Those guys have been, you know, backups. So I think it's interesting that both those guys working with the ones. And then I mentioned it earlier, but this stuff with Diamante Tucker Dorsey coming in in this sort of three linebacker look wherever DeMarbion Obershone 
moves outside and effectively just kind of you know knifes in off the edge. We talked about that before. We're like, you know, is Overshawn really a hand in the dirt kind of edge guy like they want this buck in t- to be, right? The position that Ovi Ogwofu is playing this year. And, you know, most people say, well, you, you know, no, not really. I mean, the guy used to play safety. <laughs> you know, we forget Overshawn came here as a safety, right? Um, he's not really a hand in the dirt edge guy, but dude, like is it is an outside linebacker that can line up in like a wide nine, something like that, just you know, come in off the edge just with the way whenever they get um, 41, what, 41? How come I can't think of his name? Ford. 41? Ford. Ford, yeah, Ford and two uh, Tucker in there. Whenever they get them, they get both those guys inside it, dude, and they take the nickel out. It looks good with Overshawn being able to come in and just bring some, bring some juice off the edge. We talked about how maybe they could make that work before, and it looks like they're going to be doing it with that three linebacker package. I'm not sure, you know, what frequency they'll use that sub package, but I believe it brings a new wrinkle that dude, that kind of thing has Gary Patterson written all over it too, because of the way you can fold stuff in with different stunts and different things like that. So um, I thought that was an interesting thing to see for sure. Also no Jade Barron. Um, so, I mean, if he's not ready to go week one, it'll be a freshman Jalen. Uh, it'll, it'll be Jalen Gilbo starting at the nickel, you know, it's just something kind of interesting to me. I haven't really, uh, you know, he was, he was hurt for a good bit of uh, spring. Was it he was hurt or was he kicked off the team for something? He was indefinitely yeah. suspended. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we haven't seen that. I don't really have much of an opinion on him, but he's been making the team and stuff. And now he's you know he's back and he's thrown it to, to me starter role. That goes to show the the kids probably got some game. Um, so I'll be interested to kind of follow up on the reports about how how he looks and um, you know hopefully Texas will have Jade Barron back for that first game. I think they will. He only had a very small brace on his right ankle. Uh, looked like a little kind of – not as tall as an air cast, but like a little kind of half like air cast looking thing. Uh, Roshan Johnson was moving around a lot better than Jade Barron on the on the sidelines. But Jade Barron didn't have that noticeable limp. I don't think he's going to be out for too long. But uh, we'll be interested to see Gilbo as well. So, I mean, off the top of my head, I think that those are probably the kind of interesting things that I would think about when I just kind of uh, kind of nail it down on defense. On where I'll come to you, I just want to state that for the record, Gary Patterson already getting the credit from Alex over uh, <laughs> Pete Kwiatkowski, which is one of the things we've talked about all offseason is if that defense is even a little bit better, who gets the credit? It's interesting to hear Alex slap a Patterson label on that. I don't want you to necessarily talk about that. Kind of the same question as I asked him, though, if, if there's a non-quarterbacks division – who uh, who or what position would uh, stand out the most for you right now? Yeah, so there was a couple for, for me. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, Alex and, and Gary Patterson, uh, kind of in that kind of vein, the uh, two DBs, uh, Deshaun Jameson, really stood out for me, you know, in, in that in that open practice. I mean, it was, you know, that I've been waiting. I thought that was Deshaun Jameson. I thought we would see last season. Um, just kind of all, all around, you know, around the ball. Alex, what did he have? At least two interceptions. I, I know, I remember the one. I feel like he had I two think, interceptions. I can think of one, but maybe it was two. He, no, he jumped. He jumped the route that Hudson threw. That's right. So, so there was two. So I think there was two uh, interceptions yep. for Deshaun. Um, but I, I, I just liked his activity. I, I just liked. Felt like, you know, I felt his presence there. I thought, um, from a deep perspective, I thought Jaron Thompson, uh, you know, from Tuesday had a really good practice. Uh, you know, definitely noticed him. Um, ironically, and I don't say ironically, but you know, name we heard on Saturday, he was wearing a non-contact jersey. But uh, Casey Kane uh, wasn't too bad at the receiver position. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I was, you know, you asked me about guys I was thinking about, and you know, you know guys, did, you know, may or may not be in the mix for some PT uh, this year. But Casey Kane, I thought was pretty nice, and probably, honestly, probably one of the more reliable receivers uh, on the day. And the the thing that I, I will say, you know, right now where we are, I mean, last night when I did my thing uh, catch, you know, I talked I talked about half em- class being half empty, half full, and you know, and you don't want to maybe sound the alarm, but I, can I sound the alarm? And I'm going to use something that Jason put in one of his notes. I, I'm, I'm, my alarm is sounding a little bit off the off the kicking game because I'm just, it's such an overlooked aspect. And I think you can take Cameron Dicker for granted. But when, when Jason was doing a recording of it, Will Stone uh, from 34 was good. Uh, 38 was good. 
43 was off the upright. Burt Auburn uh, missed his first kick from 35. The next one from 37 was good. The 42 yards was off the upright. So wasn't asking them to do anything spectacular. And, you know, we had you had some misses from what you would consider to be fairly reasonable ranges. Uh, and, again, I, I just don't want to th- make you think like, oh, you know, Cam- Cameron Dicker isn't here. Oh, the world is good. That's probably the, 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 the biggest area of concern I have going forward. That's kind of old. Those are the kind of things that are in my head. Jason, before we get into some Super Chat questions, mm-hmm. I wanted to give you the same forest place. It's just anything that – Stands out more than anything else from the last couple of days, going back to the open practice, but just the team in general. I think uh, Anwar brings up a great point in the kickers. We haven't really talked about it that much, but those guys can be the difference in a couple of wins or losses in close games, man. So they've got work to do there. Um, Do you guys have a Do you guys have a thought on who the starter should be? I don't even really watch the kickers. I mean, like, was there one that y'all noticed? I. I think I was going to two out of three, and uh, Bird Auburn was one out of three. They both have big legs. I mean, they both on their forty-two yarders. They both hit the upright high up on the upright, so they both have fifty-plus yard range. Just a matter, can they get it between those uprights? You know, is there a chance that Bird Auburn, Bird Auburn, is the starter? Sure, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think this is still Wesley Willstone. I mean, listen, you bring in a scholarship kicker for a reason, right? And I think it'll probably be a Willstone, but. I don't know, man. They don't know what they're going to get on that first game in right. front of 100,000 people. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it could look like a quarterback okay. position. Guy yeah. misses a couple in a row, and the other guy gets the job, and that's just the way it goes. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to interrupt your thoughts on the team, Jason. Good. I was just, I just, I really thought much about kicker. It was kind yeah. of interesting to me. I could see a scenario like Ket said, where maybe they both kick in the first game, and you know, especially if it's a blowout and you can afford to. Uh, afford to sacrifice some points potentially. Maybe they give them both some shots. But um, the other thing that does, like does, does the Sarkeesian have a binder? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Burn it if he does. Um, <laughs> another thing, and, and Anwar and I were sitting beside each other. We we're watching this, and Blake, our producer, is there too. Man, the amount of drops by the wide receivers. I was like, holy shit, another like as soon as I'm typing, like, oh, so and so drop. Damn, another one. Oh man, another one. Um, the uh. Brendan Thompson really struggled early, but then to his credit, he came back in, in full scrimmage work and had two touchdowns. One was a, I think they were both pretty deep touchdowns, and one was a really good catch in double coverage. Um, uh, so the receiver, all, I mean, even Xavier Worthy was dropping passes. Dude. I'm talking just routes on air. I was like, what the hell is going on with these guys? But they did perform a lot better, I think, as the practice went on. I tell you, the guy who I thought caught the ball the most cleanly was probably Tariq Milton. I mean, I thought Tariq Milton looked about as good as any receiver out there. I mean, working out of the slot. I mean, he did not have any of the issues that seemed to plague basically every other receiver on the roster. So um, I think Tariq Milton is going to be a nice addition for this team. I mean, it's kind of funny. We're talking about all these transfers that Texas brought in, and he he's kind of a guy that we didn't, weren't really talking about until like two weeks ago when we – we went to the very first practice and we were like, holy crap, he's running second team right behind Whittington. And uh, now he's moved up to first string. And I think Tariq Milton's going to be a guy that Texas is going to lean on pretty heavily this year, more so than we, any of us probably expected when they took his transfer. Jason, hold that thought because after we do the super chat questions, one of the things I wanted to come back to was Jordan Whittington playing on the outside on Tuesday night, opening up uh, the, the, the ability for Milton to work the slot. We had talked Really, since that injury, what would be the, their move at that position? Real quick, let's do some super chats. Texas uh, 205. Jason, who has the better season? This was specifically directed to you, Savion yeah. Red or uh, Brennan Thompson? Man, I'm going against the grain a little bit, probably. I think it's Savion Red, man. He's been really impressive. And Brennan Thompson, listen, man, you let him loose on those fly patterns or deep posts and like nobody, nobody can keep up with him. And we saw that on Tuesday night, but uh, I think Savion Red can do a lot of different things for this offense. And he's, he's also second on his depth chart. Whereas, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, Brennan, Brennan Thompson has been, been moved out to X. I mean, pe- people aren't talking about that, but he's been moved to X. He doesn't play slot anymore. So now yeah. you have, I mean, you have Tariq Milton, you have Savion Red. And then you have like high money or something like it, that's what the slot is right now. So Savion Red has a has a less less um what less like runway to 
being able to step in and get and get playing time. And I do think Brennan can help. And again, we saw flashes of that on Tuesday. But yeah, I mean, I'm probably if we're just talking from a statistical standpoint, I'm probably going to save you on red on that question. Got a question about uh, Mr. Hall, uh, Ajay Hall. Why did it take the issues leading up to the boot before they decided to create a support system for Hall? Shouldn't that have been a day one thing that from Jay Lee on or I don't know how fair that is. Like, you mm -hmm. know, you and I, we talked about this in our, our video on Monday. We were having conversations about a Jai Hall before the boot issue ever happened. And, and right. I have a theory that the arrest and the boot story actually may have saved his career at Texas because I was under the impression that on the Thursday night of the arrest, he was scheduled to have a one-on-one -on -one with Steve Sarkeesian where they were going to be talking about some of these other issues that existed uh, beyond the scenes. I don't think it's they, they reacted and then and put in a support system. I think they've been trying with Hall. You know, I wrote about this on Orange Bloods, but, you know, Hall's a young guy with a young family. He's, he, he deals with constant financial stress the way that, quite frankly, a lot of kids who are 20, 21 years old and have a baby that they take care of, like life isn't as easy as it is if you if you don't have a kid. I think there was the expectation that he would be making more in NIL than he's been making, which isn't to say that he hasn't been making NIL dollars, but I think he has been wanting, hey, those, those pampers don't buy themselves. And I think that there were just some things that they were working on behind the scenes. But this wasn't a case of him like constantly missing practice or being late or skipping school or study hall, like some of the usual stuff you hear. This is stuff that can be managed behind the scenes. I think it may have just taken the boot story and the arrest to get everybody on the same page. But I, I don't think it's that there was a support system that wasn't in place. I just think there was a getting on the same page issue more than anything else on war that was required. And hopefully they're there now. Hopefully this guy has a chance to work through the issues. It gets him back from suspension because there's clearly a place on this team for a guy with his skill set to be involved in the offense if and when he can come back. Yeah, well, I think I, you know, Jay, I have um a challenge with the the wording of 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 something in your question which is you say like support system it's it's not like a jai hall has been mandated to attend some sort of meetings or he's having to see a counselor and or there's had to be some sort of intervention or you know anything to that effect so i feel like there's been a support system you know that's been in place for him i think in jai hall has just been it's just been a maturity thing of of him being a young man that's just growing up to in dealing with a lot of things that you know catches you know reference um so you know, I, I, you know, there's not much of a support system when you're suspended and you're away from your team. Like all you can really do is think of your thoughts and and try to get yourself to back together and, and interact and st study your playbook or things to that effect to be around your family or talk to your family. His family's back in Florida. So, you know, I just think it's it's he's he's what is he 19 years old? Um, you know, you're making some mistakes. But we're not talking about felony mistakes. You know, we're talking about just, you know, maturity, growing up kind of things that need to happen. Um, you know, I don't know. There was nothing that pointed that in that direction that, you know, look, one thing happens and a giant hall is going to take, you know, a tire, you know, a boot or whatever and knock off a boot. Like no, no one said no one thought that was going to occur. It was just other things that, you know, were going on behind the scenes as far as, you know, conversations that were that that were being taken place. So, yeah, I I one hundred percent agree with Catch. You can look at it as, oh wow, this thing happened. Oh, what the hell? Or you can say, you know what, this might be the thing that calms him, that gets him to say, you know what, I don't want to risk it. I don't want to risk the money. I don't want to risk the family. Like I don't want to. You know, this is kind of a second chance. I don't want to burn this bridge. And I think in in some ways it could probably work out for him. And you want a guy to be a success story as opposed to the alternative. And, you know, only look, I don't know how much longer the guy's going to be suspended, uh, you know, with, with, 
you know, the, the need that they have at the receiver position, to be quite honest with you. Another so, yeah. chat question from Jesse Ullman. Alex, I'll let you take this one. Buy or sell, if Overshone is injured, it's a bigger deal than Isaiah Nayor's injury. No, I mean, they're both huge deals. I'd say maybe, though. Maybe with Overshone, may I, I don't know. I mean, now that they're now that they're do now that they do have Diamante Tucker Dorsey, he looks like he's going to be a good player. Um, so he's obviously a will linebacker. That's what he plays. The way to get him on the field in that role is to be able to line him up at the will, and as we talked about earlier, get Overshone at the overhang. So um, those 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 two players are a little bit redundant as far as like a base formation. So Nayer's a big deal especially with Troy O'Meara not really all the way back. It's a really good question. Um, it feels like to me that over – Isaiah Nayer is not the best player on on the uh, on the offense. You could say that DeMarvion Overshone is the best player on the defense. So for that reason, I would say it's a bigger deal to lose Overshone. One more for you, Alex. Uh, Tucker Dorsey or oh. Overshone? Who has more tackles from Texas Overshone? Football? Yeah, Overshone because yeah. because because Dorsey's going to be a sub package player. All right, staying with the theme. This one from Darwin Lemon. Uh, the ceiling for Jordan Whittington this season without injuries. Hmm. Eight hundred um, yards and like eight touchdowns. That's wow. That was that was exactly my thoughts. I don't know how the hell you you did that. That's pretty good catch. I, I don't think know. Moving I mean, him outside may uh, diminish his stats a little bit. I think if he was in the slot, he probably gets more touches. So yeah, you but say- I'll bet you. I'll bet. I'll bet you. Yeah, I'll bet you. I mean, he's he's gonna have a higher higher yards per target and stuff like yeah. that, though. Probably higher true. higher average depth of target. I mean, he, he should get more shots at really long big balls. Uh, but I would say like. I, I I don't know. Like I'd like to look and see what is what it what the uh, I mean, what's the mo- I I just you know I do so much charting of like these weird stats that I that I generally do. I don't I don't have that good of a um that good of a grasp on like what 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 is the biggest touchdown season Texas has had for a wide receiver in recent years? It was like uh, was it Duvernay Duvernay year was that the, was that like the high watermark? Could, I, could it be like a Duvernay like season? I, I'd like to go back and just see Devin Duvernay. So much volume. Yeah. Well, right. Well, but I mean, we're talking ceiling. Like we're talking ceiling, right? So um, Devin Duvernay reference. So I just want to look him up on college football reference. I think that ceiling goes up for any reason. If Isaiah, if Xavier Worthy were to miss a few games for any reason at all, and suddenly, you know what I mean? Like Woodington's see his absolute highest ceiling might be as the number one receiver in an offense where Xavier Worthy goes through what he went through a, a year ago because Worthy's stats probably aren't quite as high as they were if Whittington doesn't miss as much time as he did. So, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think he's going to. He's not going to have a definite touchdown. And Jordan yeah. Whittington's going to the NFL. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm just looking at Duvernay's stuff and – think that this is going to be a, a, a 20 i mean he had he had 106 for 1386 nine that year so yeah i, I don't see that for uh and then jay lee had place. a super chat question that just or not even that just a comment that said we now have a support system set up for hall those were sark's words i, gotta I don't be think he meant like literally maybe but i don't think he lived like almar said i don't think he's like going to see a counselor or counselor or anything i think it I think they're just taking more a bit of a hands-on approach collectively as a team. Maybe that's how I interpreted that comment. But real quick, because we're not that far away from parting shots, Alex Whittington to the outside with Milton inside. Did you like that on Tuesday? I think it's fine. I don't necessarily mean it. I don't think it's going to mean um, you know. I'm like Jason. I'm like Jason to some degree, and I disagree with him to some degree. For one, I think Milton's much better than I originally thought he was going to be. Like that's inarguable at this point. I didn't think he was a, I didn't think he was good, you know, and he's, and he's good. So I was a little bit wrong about that. I said last week, I'll take the L it's fine. Um, I don't think he's going to be a huge contributor though. Cause I, dude, I just think he's going to be a lot of two tight end stuff. I think there's going to be a ton of two tight end stuff and, and, and it's going to be worthy and it's going to be Whittington and it's going to be either helm or it's going to be, 
Billingsley or it's going to be Jatavion, and we're just going to see a lot of just a, a lot of twelve personnel. So I don't think it necessary. I don't think that this stuff necessarily means. I think that I think mainly what it means is moving Whittington out to the X. It means in practice he's going to have to play the X. He's got to play outside all that stuff. But in reality, what that move was was saying like, look, we like now that we have uh, now that we have Nayer out, we're going to have to have two wide receivers on the field. Our best two wide receivers now that this has happened are Whittington and. Um, and worthy we can't get both those guys on the field if we don't at least let Whittington practice at X so since that's going to be the case you know you know we're going to have them practice out at the X I but I, I think really what this means is more two tight end sets and Milton will be good whenever he comes in I just think it's going to be he's not going to be a, you know a, a 60% snap participant as a slot wide receiver like some of these other guys have been in recent years I think he'll be more like a 35 to 40% snap participant guys I'll open up the junior angle out portion of the injury discussion to everyone. Uh, initially, DJ Campbell steps in. There's a Cole Hudson option that also exists at that guard spot. Once he comes back from, I guess, concussion protocol or whatever is kept him out on Tuesday night. I tend to think that at some point DJ Campbell is a supernova that isn't going to be kept off the field, but there is a battle I think going on there with the decision of who replaces Angelau. Um, didn't really see anybody's move over to the center position and start taking reps or snaps there that weren't previously there. They haven't really moved the tackles around. I mean, it seems at this point that they're going like for like and right guard is out and the right guards behind them are, are the first ones to fill that void without changing too much. Um Anyone with thoughts on just – you guys, all of you seem somewhat impressed by – I'm going to be careful with the hyperbole here. But it looked better. that, that, that This incarnation of the offensive line looked a little better with Banks on the field instead of Carrick at left tackle and that DJ Campbell didn't do a disservice to the guard position while he was there on Tuesday night. Well, I'll just say it to me, like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Jason, you can go ahead. Or I, or, 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 or I can just say my piece here and get out because I got I got a hard out. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, go so, ahead. like, uh, look, here's the thing. I talked with Catch about this when I was driving home for picking up my ATV on Sunday before I wrote the column. I'm just like, look, now what what, what this means with Angle Ow Ow, it's like Christian Jones, it's going to be hard to replace him now just because he's a senior. They're not going to do it right now. Like, right, right after you lose one senior – unexpectedly you're not going to lose the other one especially when you're breaking in dj campbell there at the right guard next to him i think uh, you it's the same like hayden connor i talked about he, he only has 116 snaps last year which compared to angelow that's absolutely nothing right hayden connor last year um 116 snaps angelow last year had 699 snaps so you're talking about a guy with some experience but i will say that connor probably is the best the smartest guy on that offensive line He's the best guy with his assignments. You can tell the communication between him and Kelvin Banks over there on the left side. Like, you have a guy like that communicating with Kelvin Banks. All of a sudden, like, you're feeling good about the way that that looks, right? And so you have Jake Majors in the middle of all of it, who, for all of his faults, and, you know, for all of his faults, I mean, there's some things about Jake Majors that are good. I mean, he's not – I wouldn't classify him as being small. He's pretty – pretty big dude. I mean, he's over 300 pounds. He, um, he, he's, he's, he knows his assignments and stuff. He just has a little bit of trouble with, with strength, but you get DJ Campbell in between these two guys, right? Uh, majors and Christian Jones, at least for now, at least while he's still learning. Right. And then you have Kelvin Banks who's sitting there right next to Hayden Connor. To me, it feels like that feels comfortable for a college coach. I feel like that's the line that they feel comfortable with right now. And, um, I don't anticipate too much change. You know, people are saying like, you know, part of, part of they get Christian Jones out of there, you know, uh, why don't they just, you know, tear off the band aid and get these young, get Cam Williams in. And I just don't think that that's how you get the best out of DJ Campbell right now, whenever he's going through his, you know, just this install right now. He, I mean, th these guys are drinking it in from a fire hose right now. You don't want to, you don't want him standing next to another true freshman. So I think I, th I thought it looked good. I feel like they, they have a very vulnerable balance going on right now that not affects not only those two truly elite freshman talents, but also brings into the fold these other guys who fans might be a little bit lower on, but they probably need to stay in there for a little while just to make sure these these freshmen are at least brought along through this install in, in the correct way.
So that's that's the way that I see the offensive line and my level of comfortability with it. Hey, Alex, before you bail out, one last thing. And then, guys, I, we'll just kind of start to wrap things up. There's a super chat question for you, Jason. I'll let you have. Uh, everybody, Brandon with a $5 super chat. What are y'all's thoughts on Ethan Burke? I know we all like Ethan Burke. I feel like the grits have been a little overcooked from Tuesday. Thoughts on his placement on the defense right now? Uh, he's, third, he's the third team uh, defensive end. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, makes well, yeah, yeah the well, that's his there. place on the defense, right? That's his place, his third, his third team. But I, I mean, I think he looks better than I thought. Yeah, and here's here's the other thing I said about Ethan Burke. I said if you're going to be putting these guys like he, I I understand that he he has forty pounds that he could put on. I get that, but it didn't like he's that much like. He's the same size as a lot of these guys. He weighs 240 pounds. All, like a lot of these guys, Texas is lining up on the edge of 240 pound dudes. I mean, yeah, they're not six seven, but I mean, it, like he looks good. And you, you can watch back some of the highlights from the like, like Catch said. I mean, we, we can't overcook the grits from just one practice, but he, he's looked good in that practice. I've thought that he's looked pretty, pretty good. And I've said from I've, I've written about this. I've said it that he's a guy who just because we say he's a developmental player who is going to put on this way to be super, super beastly at some point for Texas. I don't necessarily think that that – I mean, do you remember Charles Omenahu whenever he came in? He was 229 pounds or something like that. We always said, oh, by the time he leaves here, he's going to be 285 pounds. He's going to be this giant beast. You know, now he's you know on his second NFL contract out there with the 49ers, and he is. He's big. But Charles still played as a freshman. He just played a different you – know, he, he played over at the Fox. He played behind Caleb Blewett and stuff like that, and not behind Cedric Reed and those guys. I, I don't know if those years I'm, I'm getting mixed up, but you know what I'm saying. Like he 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 played at the weak side defensive end, moved over to strong side defensive end as his body changed and his body grew. Also, somebody called me out in the chat because I said that Kai Kai Money was the guy behind those dudes in the slide. He said Kai Money retired last year, so I did look this up. Number eighty three. Right? Num yeah, num uh, number eighty three right now is is walk on Gabe. Gabe Solser, who who does look a lot like Kai Kai Money, so <laughs> I know my, what you mean. Like, I think they have the same yeah. number. <laughs> my apologies <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah. All man, right, Alex, so. get on out of here. I know you've got some other things to do. Thanks, fellas. I'll see you guys next uh, week, man. Peace. You got it. Hey, Jason, last super chat that I'm aware of, and then we'll let yeah. you. We'll get into parting shots. Caden, of all of the recruiting questions, <laughs> yeah. uh, Caden yeah. McDaniel out of Georgia, update, please. Well, Texas offered him last night, and Jesse, I don't have anything super timely. I'm going to try to call him tonight for the war room, but literally, I think it was seven days ago, maybe have been eight days ago, so roughly a week ago, um, he had an Rivals had an update on him, and he was list. I'm, it was, I'm looking Georgia, Clemson, Oklahoma, Michigan, Texas A&M, Ohio State, North Carolina State, and Florida were the schools he listed with an October decision. Uh, he's taking an official visit to Florida. He's got one set up for Michigan in September. Also mentioned he wants to visit Ohio State and Clemson. So I will try to track him down to see. He's a defensive tackle, like, which I thought was an interesting offer in itself because he kind of profiles similarly to Sadir Mitchell. So maybe they just want two of those big body D tackles, I guess. But um, I'm going to try to reach out to him tonight. So, Jesse, hopefully you're an Orange Blood subscriber. If you are, uh, I hope to have an update for, for the War Room can't make any promises but if i can get him on the phone or get him to communicate i'll have an update in the war room but it just on the surface feels like that's going to be some pretty tough competition and texas is getting into that race pretty late so uh work to be done but you know that's the same thing we thought about sadir mitchell they got him down for a visit and look what happened there so we'll see if texas can get him in for a visit i'll start to take that one pretty seriously uh, but right now I, they're facing some pretty stiff competition from teams that have been on them for a lot longer before we go into party shots, fellas, do us a solid. Like the video. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, do that to Mama, tell your papa uh, we, as we continue to build this channel going into this season. We can use all the little bit of help that we can get. Your interaction, whether it's in the chat or, like I said, liking the video, subscribe to the channel, helps us get uh, a little closer to all of our goals. On what we're going into parting shots, I'll let you uh, have the first crack at them. Yeah, so, you know, just kind of quick ones, you know, for parting shots. Guys, uh, 
make sure you subscribe to Orange Bloods. It's always out there. It's a good thing. I don't think we have any promos at the moment, but it's interesting when I follow the chat and catch, and Jason, you probably feel the same way at times, and I, I see questions being asked, and I think to myself, we covered that, you know, in a thread, you know, two days ago. We had that in the practicing. We had this over the weekend. We had that in the war room last week. And so you're really missing out. Uh, you know, again, we, we love you coming here. Love you getting the content here. But uh, go deeper. Uh, don't settle for average. Get, you know, all the questions that you have, ha you have the majority of them have been answered on Orange Blood. So uh, get on over there. And last thing, uh, you know, man, we... We're catch, you know, we were talking about this beforehand. We are 16 days away from the season opener. And catch, I, I, it, it would be hilarious if you and I summed up how many uh, videos we've done <laughs> since the end of the season until now. But to know that we actually are 16 days away uh, from kicking this thing off and getting back to um, – getting back to, you know, football and seeing what this team looks like and all that thing entails. I'm getting excited. I'm kind of pumped up. Uh, the reality of everything is starting to, you know, kick in. And I'm, you know, looking forward to seeing what the product on this field looks like. So uh, get over to Orange Bloods. Uh, don't forget about, you know, again, 16 days. Catch an eye, as, just so you guys know, if you guys are new to the channel, we will have a post-game show after, you know, every single home and away game. So get ready for that. And if it's a late game, Kent and I have been known to go until 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, talking. So get ready for that. It's going to be a lot of good content, uh, not only here on the YouTube channel, but on Orange Bloods as well. A couple of uh, late arriving uh, Super Chat questions. We'll just get these knocked out real quick. Uh, Buck Wild Gaming just got here with Rashawn down for maybe two games. Who takes over the most backup carries? Uh, it probably should be noted that Rashawn looks like maybe he could be back sooner rather than later. But guys, in a world where Rashawn is down maybe two games, uh, who do we think? It'll and I think someone kind of answered. I think it'll be Brooks and Jonathan Brooks and Keelan Robinson. I mean, Jaden Blue's in that mix too but they're going to go with the more experienced guys early in the season. Um, you know, Rosham was moving surprisingly well at that practice on Tuesday, but I talked to someone who knows someone who knows someone, and they basically said, they're, I don't think there's any way that they'll bring him back for that season opener. They do, they do not want to risk him re-aggravating an ankle, ankle injury so that he won't be available for Alabama. The hope is that he'll be available. He should be for Alabama, but even if he – if he's able to play, I don't think they play him in that opener. I mean, you know, give him whatever, 16 days away or whatever on March at eight, whatever it is. So uh, things could change, but uh, I wouldn't expect him in that opener. I would expect him for Alabama. But I think in the meantime, you'll probably see a combination of Jonathan Brooks and Keelan Robinson getting the, the back of carry. You know. And then on war, we've got last super chat question of the day uh, to both of us, I suppose. Who do you think mm. throws – the first touchdown this year and to whom love the show. Thank you. Is it Tex or Tat? It's Tex 205. Tex 205. I swear you guys don't know this at home, but when we call up the question, the letters on the chat get yeah. so small. I am I'm telling you, I do the Garrett Gilbert squint just to see what's going on. Uh Anwar, who you got? I mean, it's it's it, the obvious for me is Quinn uh, to Xavier, but I don't know if I'm if I'm overthinking it, um, you know. But throws the, he says throws the first TD of the year. I mean, it's got it's got to be a deep pass to Xavier, right? It's got to be something early in that in that on that first possession that gets uh, everyone sided. You know what though? No, because I don't I, I don't know if Jordan Winnington's going deep, but against maybe that Louisiana secondary, it might be. It, it's a fantastic – it's one of the two – or – all right, I got it. I got it. I got it. Are you ready? It's it's a si simple screen pass to B. John Robinson, short touchdown. There you go. <laughs> I am going Quinn Ewers with one of those toss pitches that counts as a pass. <laughs> so it's like first and goal at the four. Uh, and I think Xavier comes in motion – that little underhand pitch that technically counts as a pass. He walks into the end zone. 
I'm going tried and true. I'll go Quinn Ewers with Xavier Worthy. I wouldn't bet against Xavier Worthy no. uh, in the in the touchdown reception battle. Uh, but yeah, trying to pick a needle out of the uh, oh one more super chat question, and because it's family, we will let it count. Who starts on the edges? Where's Alex when we need him, right? <laughs> I mean, at this point, I feel like it's going to be Sorrell on one side and Ovio Gofu gets the first crack on the other. Yeah, I would probably correct. agree with that, yeah. yeah was, and then, was, and then I think what happens in games really matters. And so both of those guys, if they're super productive, keep those jobs. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of thoughts inside the program that Baron Sorrell is going to have a big year. Everybody's really high on him, but you got to do it in the games. And should that turn into production, I, I see no reason why he wouldn't keep that job. I think that buck position where Ovi is currently positioned and playing less linebacker and more there, I think it remains to be seen who is the most productive player. I'll tell you what, uh, Barry, Barron holding down his spot so that the coaches – can just figure out who the hell is going to give them production at that other spot would really be the best thing that could happen to this team. Um, I don't want to end the the modcast on a note where it's like both positions aren't quite given the production that they want, but if Baron does what the guys inside the program seem to think he's capable of, then they just need, they need a pass rush from that other, that other spot. And the games haven't started yet. I don't think any of us are going to go too crazy with, sack predictions yet who knows maybe demarvion overshone ends up being a guy that plays in that spot situationally uh, and provides the production that they're looking for uh thanks for the super chat question though barry we always love it when you get involved here's hoping uh if you've got a if a drink nearby here's a toast uh to baron having a hell of a building block year that allows for him to turn into one of the better players in the big 12 at his position. Uh, Jason, your final part in shot. Yeah, pretty slow recruiting week, um, which you'd understand. High school football has started. Obviously, the Texas coaches are focused on their own team. Um, but I did catch up with Cedric Baxter's coach this weekend, the recent running back commitment for Texas. Baxter really doesn't talk very much. And it's weird. If you didn't know any better, you'd think, ah, he's just – whatever, just doesn't like to talk, doesn't like the media, and he, he doesn't. But, um, you know, I, I I had kind of a wrong impression. I was like, ah, he's probably one of these damn kids. He just, you know, pain in the ass or whatever. But in talking to his coach, man, I really – I wish Cedric Baxter would talk more because I talked to his coach this week. I'll have it in the war room. And he talks about Cedric Baxter the same way B. John Robinson's coach talked about B. John Robinson. And ironically, B. John didn't talk much either. Um, but in terms of leadership and character, being a dynamic receiver out of the backfield, I remember Bijan's coach is like, I will stand on the table. He is the best receiving back in the country coming out of high school. Cedric Baxter's coach feels the same. I mean, they're both big backs that can run with power. I hung up the phone this week talking to uh, Coach Cameron Duke, is his name, thinking, damn, I mean, he, I even told him, it's like, you were, you're reminding me so much of the things I'm hearing about Bijan Robinson. So uh, I'm interested, interested to watch, um, watch him this year, see how, how he does as his senior year. I think he'll do exceptionally well. I don't understand why rivals dropped Baxter in the rankings. That's a whole other discussion, but uh, yeah, I think people will enjoy the conversation. I'll probably just type it up in Q and a form uh, for the war room. And he couldn't have spoke more highly of Cedric Baxter not just as a player, though. I mean, we expected that, but the stuff he said about him as a leader. In fact, I'll just say, he said, and I don't have my notes. I think he said in, he's been coaching 19 years at Orlando Edgewater. And this and, uh, coach Duke was voted the Florida state coach of the year one year. So he's, this is a guy with some skins on the wall. He said in 19 years, I think it was CJ Baxter is the best leader he's ever had in his program. So pretty, pretty strong word. So uh, I think people enjoy it and I'm looking forward to, to putting that out in the war room tonight. My final parting shot is just a reminder. Give out a little love to myperfectfranchise.net. Give Andy a call. He's a sponsor of today's modcast. Uh, always doing fantastic work for um, 
orange bloods everywhere that want to live the dream and stop working for the man, contact Andy, 404-973-9901 or Andy at myperfectfranchise.net. The list of success stories that he's had from orange bloods um, over the course of a year or two who've done exactly what I'm telling you he does. He helps guys start their own businesses, start their own franchises, and start living the dream that they've always wanted to live uh, but weren't quite sure how to pull it off. That's what Andy's there for. Thanks to him for being a fantastic sponsor and, and, and partner of ours over at orangebloods.com. Uh, also, as Mike Torres says, shout out to producer Blake, who on bar had to drop off at school this morning. Oh, Blake, feel free to come in and defend yourself I on that. Maybe you pop in, man, so you can get some face. Nah, that was from last night. It's a playoff of last oh, night. Okay, we were talking okay, about okay. How, how young Blake looked, and then we started talking about. It's his- true. Two, two thoughts from last night. When yeah. Blake does drop in, he makes us all look 20 years older. <laughs> he is a baby face producer. It's true. Uh, the true. other thing, Anwar, I love that color of blue on you. Ooh, well, thank you. Right. Well, thank if you. I, well, mine and Blake's blue. What about what Blake and I wearing blue? Come on, man. Yeah. Well, as I was saying, Anwar, I love that color of blue on you last night. Oh, First time I think I've seen you in that blue in particular yeah, with the hat. Yeah. And the chain. The chain was it, it was good. it was my it's my favorite color I've ever seen on you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate yeah, that. Just, I, I, appreciate I that. wanted to say that in the chat last night and didn't want to distract you from too much, but I know you watched. I'm glad you watched. That's it. I I'm did. I, watch. I cut it off at 1030. I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that I was, was going to keep going. I was like, I was amped up. I was coming back from basketball practice. I was still like fired up. So oh, I know. And it got a little bit later. There was definite something in that cup. Like by the end of it. <laughs> Definitely. What's up, the end of, I don't know if it was drunk, Uncle, but it was buzzed, Uncle. Uh, <laughs> for myself, yes. For hey, our quick, fantastic producer. Catch. Text you guys just five uh catch. What about Keely from Notre Dame? Oh. I've I've reached out to him, but I haven't heard any uh buzz with him in Texas. Uh all signs seem to be pointing to, to Alabama. He's from Tampa and Texas has got it cooking in Tampa, so it makes you wonder. But like all of the buzz right now is on Alabama, and Jason and I have we've we've had the Keeley conversation. Jason's reached out to Keeley. Uh, I don't know that I would sit around waiting too long for that to materialize, but you never know. Uh, but I, it, I I wouldn't I wouldn't gamble money on it. Uh, but for myself, our fantastic producer, uh, who is way too young looking to be his actual age. You're going to be carded until you're like 45. Yeah. Uh, Jason, and Alex, Anwar, and myself, guys that don't get carded anymore. We will. I might. Someone asked earlier about the OB at night show. I didn't do it this week because literally practice was from seven to nine. And there was just a lot going on with the practice. And then I wasn't feeling that well. I might, depending on what we do with the war room, I might even do one tonight. I'm not saying I definitely will. I'm just saying that I know we didn't get it done on Tuesday. And if at all possible this week, we can. I might, who knows? I might pull one of those nine o'clockers like Anwar did. But stay tuned. I will get the OB at night show going back as well. Uh, but for all of us, we did a pretty good job of keeping it at basically an hour. Uh, you guys have a great Thursday. War room tonight. You guys take care of each other. Later.